Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to do a deep dive first look at 1812, Napoleon's fateful march, designed by Brian Asklev and published by VUCA Simulations. This game recreates Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812, where he lost over 80% of his half million man army. Much of that due to weather, disease, and starvation. Before we jump in and get started, I want to quickly mention one of our channel sponsors, Noble Knight Games. VUCA Sims is an up-and-coming wargaming company, and if you're looking to pick up some of their incredibly well-designed games, a great place to check out is Noble Knight Games. They're a retailer in Wisconsin that sells new and used war games, as well as board gaming supplies and miniature supplies, and they ship internationally as well. They have a wide range of VUCA stuff at fairly competitive prices, and if you're interested in taking a look, there's a link down below. If you do use that link, uh, thanks very much as some of the proceeds do help the channel. Back to the matter at hand, how does this game handle this incredibly historic invasion? Let's jump in and take a look. As we take a look at the components, let's do a brief overview of gameplay. First, the historical context that the game sits in, and of course, is 1812. But more specifically, it's the months of June all the way through the beginning of November 1812. And this covers essentially six different scenarios that the game provides. Some scenarios are as short as one historical month. And then you have the Grand Campaign, which starts on June 5th and ends on November 5th, covering the entire campaign in the invasion of Russia. Now, now, gameplay is listed as three to six hours. Obviously, the shorter numbers for the smaller scenarios and, and six hours for the grand campaign. And turns are essentially, there's kind of two designations for turns. Gameplay is broken down into months, but each month consists of five different turns. So you could kind of say that each turn is, is roughly a week within those month-long spans. Now, again, the historical length, anywhere from one to five months for the different campaigns. And this is a grand scale campaign game. There's, I mean, each units are designated designated by strength points, and it's a fungible asset like currency, so you can mix and match these strength points in different ways that you like. And each strength point equals 10,000 infantry troops or 5,000 cavalry troops. It's probably also worth mentioning that this is decidedly a two-player game. The game's solitaire rating is a one. We'll talk a little bit more about solitaire as we explore some of the rules and mechanics and things, but it's definitely its strength is going to lie in the two-player experience. Let's talk a little bit now about some of the key mechanics. First up, this is a point-to-point -point map game. There's no hexes nor areas. You're moving your strength points and your armies along these different points, and they're all connected by various tracks and roadways. And stacking with these strength points is theoretically unlimited, but uh, there's a number of constraints on why you would not want to have too many troops in one particular area, the least of which is that supply situation. The larger force you have in a given area, the more likely that force is to suffer the effects of attrition and supply problems. And there's a command element as well, which means that you've got to have commanders that are able to control and command larger forces of troops. So for a number of gameplay restrictions are going to kind of limit the amount of troops that you're going to probably have in any one given area. Now, we mentioned that this is a solitaire unfriendly game for sure and the, the reasons why are these two mechanics first up um, there are hit there are order blocks that you're going to be placing out that are hidden from your opponent and then you're going to go through a sequence of play that we'll articulate in a little bit more detail as we get further into the video where you're going to reveal the orders that you've hidden from your opponent in kind of an orchestrated back and forth sequence with your opponent so for one thing you're not going to know what orders your opponents have given their troops or are giving their troops and also in addition to that that larger commanders can pull their strength points off of the map and hide them behind screens. So not only you're not going to know what your opponent's going to do, you might also be struggling to figure out where your opponent is. So for both of those reasons, it really isn't a, is it isn't a mechanical game where solitaire is, is highly articulated. This is, again, shining as a two-player experience. Other things, there's initiative modeled in the game. Now this is, uh, we mentioned in the introduction, one of, of course, the, the aspects of this campaign was just the horrific attrition that both armies suffered, but in particular Napoleon's invasion force. And that is modeled within the game. There's weather, there's supply effects, and there's an entire attrition phase of the game at the end of each of the turn where you're going to calculate, depending upon the weather impact, how many troops you're going to lose. Now, that means that very much you're playing supply in this game. You're trying to keep your own units in supply and hinder the supply capacity of your opponent. And it feels like that element of the game could be one of the key factors and the deciding factors in who's going to come out as the winner. 
also impacting that even a little bit more it's as we can see on the the left hand corner here um, there's a lot of cards and this is a heavily card influenced game some of these cards and looking them over they look downright nasty i mean you can really wreak havoc with your opponent by some well-placed cards again simulating some of the horrific effects of weather and other disasters that happened to the armies in the course of this campaign weather as i just mentioned too is another mechanic that's more modeled and the french forces as well can forage as they're going through the russian landscape and there you have the essential mechanics in addition to a combat phase and things like that we'll talk about the sequence of play as we look at the map a little bit later on let's jump in now and take a look at our rule book relatively modest rule set there are 19 pages in this document text is rather large and it's only two columns now their graphics are light but they're there when you need them and the rule book really find, kind of follows a format where the first third or so outlines some of the components and talks about some of the gameplay elements and then it really goes into uh, a sequence of play and a very elaborate sequence of play so i think as kind of a, a strategy for learning this game you could really kind of set it up and then use this extended sequence of play as kind of a guide to lead you through your first couple of learning games to learn how to play the game um, some of the concepts are relatively new to me uh, in terms of the way they manage kind of strength points and combat and the way you're executing the orders in a different sequence. Um, so it's a little bit of uh, stuff it's, that's, I think would say kind of creative and innovative in terms of how they're handling the entire campaign, as well as hidden orders and the hidden strength points and stuff like that and the way leaders work. Um, but for the most part, nothing seems exceptionally complicated. If I had to give this rule book a, uh, if I had to give the, the game a complexity rating based on what I've seen so far, I'd say a three and a half out of 10. And the back of the box gives it a four out of 10. So I don't think we're, we're very far apart on that. The game also comes with this playbook, which the main bulk of this is covers the, the how to set up and play the six different uh, scenarios that are in the game. And we'll talk about those momentarily, but I do want to call attention to the fact that there's some good um, historical context and setting material in the back here. Uh, Dice and deck statistics, which is really an interesting read. Players notes for both Russia and France here. And then some designer notes, the human cost of the campaign, and then a reading bibliography. So really kind of historical supplements to, to helping to immerse the player in the game uh, state even more. But the, the bulk of this, again, is the six different scenarios that are there. And these scenarios, there's one one-month one scenario, two two-month scenarios, a three-month scenario, a four-month scenario, and then the grand campaign is the five-month scenario that starts in the uh, June 5th and goes all the way to the end of November here. But these are the setup information. Again, with straight points, um, you don't really, the setup is going to look, I think, pretty quick here. Um, and then the other five scenarios are basically snapshots of different components of the campaign. So there's a one-month scenario that covers the last month, the retreat, Napoleon's retreat out of Russia. Um, some of them cover the first couple months, some of them focusing on the battle around Smolensk and stuff like that too. So kind of a way you can play, if you don't have the full six hours to play the entire grand campaign, you can play elements of the campaign in a much shorter time span. Let's jump in and take a look at our counters. Now, these counters are slightly over a half an inch, about nine sixteenths of an inch wide for the military units here. And again, units represent strength points. So we're looking at the French units here. Most of the ones without a numerical designation represent one strength point. These, of course, are two up to 10 and five. And again, these are fungible strength points, so you can mix and match them as you're playing the game. We also have some French allies down here, the Austrians with the red and white flag, and then the Prussians with the black and white flag here. Now, the bottom left here are the major commanders. These are the French ones. These have little stands that you put them on. And if you don't want to use the stands for the units you can use, there are some counters. We'll take a look at those that you can substitute in for them. But these basically are going to represent a vast force because you can hide units behind the commander's screens that we'll take a look at. So if Napoleon has troops attached to him, those are all going to be hidden. And all you're going to see on the board is basically Napoleon representing what is probably a large army, but you don't have a very good idea if you're the opponent. So again, getting at that idea of hidden force and hidden orders here, a lot of ambiguity to, to kind of sort through as you're playing the game, which sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun challenges to deal with. Now, the left side here, top left, these are the devastation markers. As you, troops have battles in areas and as they forage and use the areas for supply, the devastation markers are going to go up in different areas, representing the area's capacity, diminished capacity to support troops. 
Now, if we flip these over, we can see there's a backside here. Um, exhaustion is modeled within the game, so we can see all these poor troops walking in the snowstorm as their strength points are all depleted. And these are uh, severely diminished in capacity in terms of what they can do. They're basically just wandering around and, and bringing them back up to full strength is very important. But again, the idea of attrition in this game is a huge modeled factor of this gameplay. Now we can see devastation markers here up to two and then the backside on these uh, stand-up counters. There are four sheets in all and, 300 and roughly 320 counters in the game. We're looking now at the Russian units, which are green, same kind of idea, these fungible strength points that can be combined like currency. And then backside here for them, where we've got uh, diminished the, the exhausted troops here. Now there's uh, different types as well. We do have, especially Russian Cossacks, have some special rules and there's some cavalry here. We can see some French cavalry. I think if we get up here, yeah, here we go to the, the Cossacks for the Russians, which have a special couple of orders that they can perform. And we get cavalry for the Russians and more infantry here. Flipping these over, <clears throat> we can also see uh, attrition checked. So this, these three point markers can be used to, um, as you're going through one stage at the end of each turn is to check the supply status and how much attrition these units are going to suffer. And that's where if you have a large group and bad weather, it can get really nasty fast for you. So again, that whole idea of making supply hard for your enemy and making supply good for you feels like it's going to be a huge element of gameplay. Now, these are the alternate leader counters. If you don't want to use these stands here, you can just put these counters down on the board instead, so you have the option to do that. And I don't know, I have been playing war games for three years since I've come back in the middle of COVID. I've not lost a counter to a single game. I have no idea where this one went. I opened up the box again and it was just gone. So I'm not sure what I did with it. I'm sure it was here. I'm sure I lost it, but I can't find it. Anyway, neither here nor there. Those are our four counter sets. What we're looking at now are the stands that you build to basically hide your units. So you're going to fold these together here like that, stand them up. And then when you have this unit in a particular area, you can take all of the force and hide them behind your board here so your opponent can't see them. Again, creating an idea that you might know as the opponent where Platov is, but you don't know the strength that he's got with him. Creating again, that whole idea of ambiguity in gameplay. The front of these also lists some of the special characteristics. Most of these designated leaders, I think there's seven for the French and eight for the Russians. Uh, most of these designated leaders have some special abilities uh, that kind of influence gameplay play. Really nicely done. These look like they're, I mean, just beautiful, adding a lot of flavor. I love the portraits they've got for all of the different leaders here too. So uh, very, very well done. Looks like it's going to add a lot. Just in terms of bringing you into gameplay too, these types of portraits I think are really cool. But when we take a look at the cards, that's where I think the artwork in the game really, really shines. So let's take a look now at some of the cards in the game. There are 108 cards, so roughly a little bit over 50 for each player. We're looking right now at some of the Russian cards. And most of these cards consist of a, a couple of pieces here. Up in the top right, we can see these numerical orders. These are the default, what you can, you can basically play one card at the beginning of a turn to increase the number of orders you can give in a turn. But um, uh, you've also got these events here. And some of these are pretty nasty in terms of like scorched earth or indecision and confused retreat and things like that, where you're going to be playing these cards at various moments during the game. And some of them, again, we can see here this sun. So these are summer cards. They aren't available at any other time in the game. Some are summer cards, some are winter cards, and then others can be used at any different point in time. But in the hand, you're going to be having a number of these cards that you can play in various situations and circumstances to kind of switch the, the the battle and turn things up. And I feel like learning these cards and playing these cards well can make a huge influence in the game. Some of them seem quite powerful and, and quite pivotal if you could get them played at the right time. You know, even if we look at the, the Scorched Earth one here, you know, basically it's a small example. It says, play along with your OPS card. It says, if France has the initiative, reduce it by one. So it gives the Russians more of an initiative immediately increase the devastation level in up to five areas, which would reduce the capacity again of the French to be able to live off the land and things. Um, and they can be adjacent to any Russian strength points and you get one evade order. So this again, symbolizing the idea that, you know, the Russian forces are withdrawing back into the homeland and leaving burned earth behind it that the French can no longer kind of sustain their army off of. A lot of these cards do have those types of flares. And then at the bottom too, right down in this smaller text, we can see kind of 
historical context for the game. So really kind of tying you to how this card represents an action or an event or something that happened in the real campaign. So really kind of, I, I think these cards do a marvelous job both with their art and with this flavor text on the bottom to really kind of bring you into the historical story of this campaign. So these I think are just absolutely marvelous. And here we get a look at the French cards, the same kind of thing. And we can see down here, these with the snowflake, these are the winter cards, and then a bunch of summer cards here. Uh, there, there are, I'd say the majority of the cards can be used any time. It just happens to be the way I've divvied them out here that you can see uh, mostly some of the seasonal cards here. But again, we got war weariness, Holy Mother Russia, hard marching, energetic leadership. The name's so evocative of different things that could happen in this historical context with some really neat events and then the flavor text down below. Also of note here is this dummy card. So at the beginning of each turn again, you can be playing a card for its operational point value. If you decide not to play one for its operational point value, you can put down this dummy card to make your opponent think you're playing one for to increase your operations and orders in a turn, but you're not. You're actually saving your cards for later. So you're always going to have that dummy card in your hand. So yeah, I just the, the cards here look like they're really going to be a, a huge element in gameplay, bringing a lot of replayability too, and just in terms of the ones that you're going to get in a particular game and the way that you can use them and the timing of them here too. So just a marvelous job with both artistically, historically, and I think in terms of uh, enhancing gameplay with these card decks here. Let's take a quick look at our two player aids. Actually, there's four. Um, there's two identical sets, one for the French player, one for the Russian player. Here we can see the sequence of play, uh, player aid. And again, a as with VUCA uh, traditional standards of quality, these are extremely thick and hefty player aids, really good heft to them and feel to them, high quality cards here. So this is the sequence of play. These are identical, it's just got a color difference, one for each of the players here, outlining the sequence of play. And again, I think following that sequence of play is really going to help uh, kind of streamline gameplay and help make things uh, easy to follow along and easy to learn here. Here we can see again the combat results. This is the attrition table where you're going to be factoring in losses due to weather and things like that. But uh, yeah, these two are the same and identical. And then we've got one more pair here, which has the mapped legend on it for each player. And then on the other side, we get French leader abilities, leader abilities, Russian leader abilities, so that if you're wondering what your opponent's leader abilities are, you've got them all right here. And then weather again, playing a big role in the campaign. Before we take a look at the map in general, let's take a look at some of the bits and odds and ends here. Uh, these are the combat dice. Uh, one, the blue one here is for the French, and then the green one here is for the Russian. And one of the unique aspects of that are that some of these die rolls only apply during particular seasons. So in the summer, there's four applies, and bigger number is good. So as the French are using this die here, they want bigger numbers. So during the French, they, the, in the summer, they get a four. However, if it's winter, they get a minus one, again, signifying their diminished capacity to fight well in the winter. Russians have some numbers on theirs as well. This one is if the, they're on defense, they get a bonus, but otherwise those numbers are treated as a zero. This is used for determining the weather and the attrition rolls there. And then these cubes here are where you're going to be building your supply depots on the map. So you drop these on certain cities and that indicates that you've now got a supply depot in that location. More odds and ends to take a look at. These are the plastic standees for those tall leader counters that you can use. And then we have two sets of blocks, one green for the Russian and blue for the French. And those are used to put down your order sticker. So these are the stickers for those blocks. And again, you're going to have a certain number of orders per turn. You're going to have these stickers that are on one side and you're going to be putting these down on the map to indicate the location where you're going to be giving orders, but your opponent doesn't know what those orders are. And you'll notice here that as well, there are dummy orders as well. So you could drop an order into a particular place as kind of a deception move so that your opponent thinks you're gonna do something there, but really there's nothing going on there and your real activity could be someplace else. So again, yeah, these are the block markers and all of the, the ones that you're gonna be using on those blocks for designating, in particular, designating orders in the game. And lastly, we come to our 22 inch by 29 and a half inch mounted map. Very high quality here. I love the art style of the game in general, just the blue and the green really seems to, uh, the color palette usage that 
that VUCA Sims uses just really kind of always flows together so nicely. And again, I get kind of this stark feel, especially I imagine as you're drifting into winter and you're Napoleon's army foraging for food, you can feel almost the barren nature of the lack of resources for your troops as you're playing this game. On the bottom right, we can see the turn marker and then the victory point track. Victory in the game is determined by victory points and those are calculated in terms of you're gonna have some card effects that can impact victory points, battle results, and then the conquest of cities is the way the victory points swing. And basically, you're trying to get more victory points than your opponent, and that's how you win the game. And I think there are certain scenarios that start with a certain victory point advantage to one player or the other, signifying kind of the, the balancing out factor of that. Now, um, I probably want to mention here, too, the sequence of play, because I think uh, it's worth noting how the gameplay works. And as we kind of look at the map, and I'll show some close-ups, I'll just briefly touch on that. So each turn, each month starts with the resources phase, and that's where you're going to get replacements and different replenish them of your cards as well. And then you drift into, five, each month consists of five turns. So a resource phase happens once every five turns. Um, and as you go into these smaller turns that each probably represent about a week of gameplay, they're divided up into 14 different stages. Now, stages one through four are where both sides are placing their orders and there's kind of a sequence, a mini sequence of play for how you determine how many orders you have and how you're playing those orders. Then uh, se steps five to eight is where you're executing your orders, mainly the move orders. So in sequence, you, both sides are going to alternate and execute their forced march orders, then your cavalry patrols, then your, uh, your marches, and then your evade orders. And then at that point, you come into the ninth step of the turn, which is where you're going to resolve your com combat. And then after that, steps 10 through 12 are a rally phase and then some Cossack raids. We saw those special Russian Cossack units. And then uh, you're going to be placing any supply depots if you've got those orders in place and can do that. Once that's done, you come down to the last two stages, which stage 13, ominously numbered 13, is your attrition stage. And that's where you're going to calculate the impact of weather and the attritional losses per turn. So again, the gradual wearing down of both armies, but in particular, the French army, which can't sustain those casualties as well as the Russians can. And then the last one, uh, 14, is you're checking your lines of communication, and that has some impacts on gameplay as well. And that's basically then a lather, rinse, repeat of those five turns before you go back to the next month where you're going to start the month with the resource phase. So that's a quick look here as we look at the map in terms of um, you know, outlining how the gameplay will flow. And we can see on the map here too, we've got some fortresses. These numbers by some of the cities up here designate how many victory points they're worth. And then the, the communication, the transport lines, there's things like bridges and there's tracks. The smaller ones that influence supply, those are less able to provide supply, different co components in here. And you've got your uh, border edges that are kind of off the map ones that provide supply for you as well. But the supply conditions in the game seem pretty harsh. You really have to be on top of your game to manage that well. And with that, we've taken a look at 1812. The last thing I want to mention a little bit is that just kind of a couple of thoughts on solitaire play. The, the game box gives it a rating of one out of 10 or nine or something like that, which is basically saying, don't bother. <laughs> don't bother playing at solitaire. I, I feel like it's not quite as ominous as that. Like if you really wanted to, I think you could compromise some of those hidden aspects of gameplay, do your best to play both sides and probably manage this as a solitaire experience. Um, I will probably give it a try at some point, but I definitely want to play this two-player because I think that's where it's really, really going to shine. Um, I do think if you were determined, you could probably play it solitaire. I'd probably go more like a, a two and a half on the solitaire rating if you say, okay, I'm going to play to the best of my ability regardless of what I know about the other side. I think you could make it work, but it is very clear that this is a game that is designed specifically for the two-player experience, both with the hidden orders and the hidden uh, force pools in terms of your leaders taking some of the units off the map and things. There you have it, 1812, Napoleon's Fateful March, the newest edition in VUCA's line of games. Um, I will be bringing another video to the channel. I'm not quite sure yet how or what I'll do for that. I want to kind of show some gameplay after I've played a little bit and then give some impressions on gameplay as well. So we'll be back with more of this game in the future. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great day.